Well, good morning, and welcome to Calvary. Isn't it a beautiful day? Isn't it amazing what some sunlight does? Folks, this morning, I was here early, okay? The sun rises over here. The lights weren't on in here. The light was pouring through those stained glass windows. It was just blowing up this whole room. It was absolutely beautiful. Sometimes you got to come here early on a sunny, sunny morning. You'll just sit in here and go, ah, oh, so nice. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. It's going to be a great day. It already has been a great day. Things that are happening. Ladies Bible study. Chapter 11 of the Angels, uh, book that they've been looking at. If, you, if you'd like to be part of that, uh, let me know. I'll get you in contact, get you the email, get you this, get you that. You can pop in, zoom in and stuff. Uh, uh, hopefully at some time in the future, we'll get a, 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 a click of ladies getting together in the same room and having a good time. But uh, other things that are happening. The Lord's Table we're going to have today. So I'm going to speak, I'm going to, i got a message on grace, and then we'll take a mini break. Uh, Chantelle, you're teaching today? So uh, we're getting near the end of the message, we've got to try and find a way to let Chantelle know. I'm, I'm not going to be real long, so she can pop back upstairs, uh, and then we'll have the Lord's table, it won't be long, it'll be nice, it'll be good, okay? I won't, we're not going to be super long, we're not going to be all afternoon, okay? We're not down like, a, we go down to the DR, they have really long uh, services sometimes. And then we're going to go downstairs, we're going to have a potluck. We're going to have some fellowship, some time together. So whoever comes, we're going to get together and do that. And if for some reason, you know, you can't stay for the potluck or for the Lord's table because you need to go someplace, that's okay. I won't be insulted, okay? Okay, I'll cry afterwards, but that's okay. Other things happening. Bill, Mr. Bill, I'll give you an update on Mr. Bill. Mr. Bill now, he is, he is, he's, he's, he's at the uh, nursing home there in Norwood, okay? He's in room 140. He would love a visit. He would love a visit. He says he, he's doing great spirits. So just let me know. We'll, we'll get you in there. Uh, if you want to go down, I'll go down with you. He'd love to be there. And his goal is to get home. He's working so hard at it. Uh, it's amazing. He, what an attitude this guy has. You go visit him. You walk out like you're walking on cloud nine. He just makes you feel good. And the last thing I want to mention, gardening date. We're going to do some gardening here, right? Note there's a picture there of mulch that's right out in the parking lot. Five yards of mulch. We're going to be doing so either next Saturday or next or the Saturday after at 10 a.m. I say next Saturday at 10 a.m. The reason I'm saying that is uh, if it rains, I don't know what it'll be next Saturday. We'll go to the, to, to the following Saturday. So we'll get that spread. We have a lot of seeds to plant outside. It's a fun time, folks. It, it just is to be outside. I wish it could have been a day like uh, yesterday or today, but we'll get what we get. And I think <coughs> my church is the last thing that we need. I'm in my church, right? I hope you're in your church. And Chantilla is making these little video clips for the, new, for, for, for the uh, website, okay? I'm not talking about... Give me 15 seconds. My church is a place of peace. My church is a place I go for comfort. My church, whatever it is, just say that. She'll record it. Because people are out there, and the way they find out about where to go is through the Internet. Whether you like it or not, you need to get over it. That's how people find it. I, I got over it. I'm okay, sort of, okay? So please, please, uh, see Chantilla. We're going to be having a potluck. You can, it's an easy thing to do, folks. Please be part of this. But having said that, let's do this. Let's stand up. Let's sing some songs. Let's sing some praises to the Lord. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what a such praises what other splendor outshines the sun what other majesty rules with justice only a holy God
like fire. What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God. Only my holy
done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Amazing grace. Funny thing, today's message is about grace. Imagine that. Hey, folks, it's a great day to be here. And yo, look at Joseph is off to Junior Church already. He's not messing around. Junior Church, why don't you run away if you'd like to, okay? Hey, fake, folks, give each other a wave. Hey, and at the end of service, when I get praying, could someone run downstairs and get Chantilla? Okay. Give a shake. Have a seat. Enjoy yourselves. You're here for the duration. Why, thank you. Wow, they're pretty excited out there in the foyer. There's a lot happening, I guess, huh? A lot happening there. Well, once again, good morning. Welcome to Calvary. I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you're here. And... We shall get started. We shall get started. I am what I am by grace. You see Popeye up there, huh? Remember Popeye? He's like from 1929 or something it started, right? Funny thing, Chantilla just went downstairs. So last night, Chantilla and her roommate, Leanne, they came over to our house to do a, a, a mini game night. And they were going to bring pizza. But Riverside was closed for a graduation. You know where they got, they got us food? They went to Popeye's. No word of a lie. They went to Popeye's. So I had Popeye's chicken last night. It was so funny. He said, but Popeye's there. Popeye's famous for I am what I am. Or as he said, I am what I, I am, what I am, right? You know, when he said it. I, I don't know. I think he was from East Boston. I don't know. But uh, grace, it's all by grace, folks. And grace uh, is a term that's used continually in churches all the time, right? Use this word grace. We claim to be a church that we're saved by faith through grace. And you are saved by faith through grace. No other way, okay? But what's grace all about, okay? What does it mean and how do we relate to it in reality on a daily basis? Is grace a reality in my life? Or just another word that we use to build a wall around us at times, right? The church words. I'm always big on the church words, aren't I, huh? Grace, faith, mercy, satisfaction, propitiation. That's my favorite, isn't it? Propitiation. I just like saying it. You know, I could, I know, the whole, I could just go on like that. It's like, I am what I am. It just means satisfaction. That's all. Christ was the satisfaction. He paid our, the sin debt that we owed. These words are in the arena of church life. Are they useful? Are they evident in our daily life, those words? Are they there for us? Have you, have I experienced grace in a way that we know it's real? That grace is tangible in my life. Is it tangible? Grace. Let's define it. Let's do some Greek. He always acts like, I act like I'm a Greek scholar, right? Charis. I, I got like five Greek words. And my favorite one's baklava. That's it. I don't know Greek. But I do know what it means, right? You know what it means? It means unmerited favor. Unmerited favor that comes from God. Okay? Does that sound sterile to you? Because it does to me. I have unmerited favor. Does that sound cool? 
And earlier this week, I got my updated tetanus shot too, right? That's what I feel like. It's kind of sterile, isn't it? Unmerited favor by itself. It doesn't work for me that well. Because grace is a gift. It is. Ephesians 2, for by grace we are saved through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. That verse describes grace as a gift. It's a gift. It comes from God. We understand gifts, and we understand payments. We certainly do, right? We don't pay for gifts. I give you a gift. If I give you a gift, you should not feel obligated to give me a gift back. You just should not. If I've given you a gift, okay, and you want to give one back, I understand. That's a nice gesture. I get it. I get it. But uh, I gave it to you for a reason. I gave you a gift out of love, out of encouragement, out of appreciation. I didn't give you a gift to get something back, okay? Because when you do that, it becomes an exchange. It becomes an exchange, okay? What should we do and what should we be after we receive a gift? We should be genuinely thankful, right? That's all. Just be thankful when you receive a gift. Just start there. Just start there. You know what? If you are thankful, the person that gave you a gift, it feels great. When you're thankful for something, people just feel great they gave it to you. And people express that thanks so many different ways. Some people are crazy. Oh, it's a gift. And they get all excited and stuff. And they start hugging and kissing you. And you say, oh, chill. Okay, yes. And it's cool. But you know they're thankful, right? Other people are a little more stoic. Thanks. This is really good. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Now, if you have a relationship with that person and you know they're a little stoic, you know they're genuinely thankful, isn't it? It's okay. We're not all the same, folks. I don't want everyone to be like me, for sure. And I don't think you want everyone to be like you. I like the variety, you know, the spice of life. We need to be this way. But if we understand thanks, does our life say thank you? Is the Spirit of God, is it truly inside me? Is my walk daily one of thanksgiving? Do I emote or express thanksgiving? I don't mean going around silly. I mean, do I have a genuine countenance of thanksgiving in my life? Now, there's so many verses that talk about grace in the, in the Word of God, okay? You know what it was like? I said, I got to do a, a message on grace. I just was compelled to do this. You start looking. At, it was sort of like when you look at the Bible. You know when you go to like a fancy restaurant and they've got this huge menu, you turn in page after page after page, and you're only going to get one meal. And what do you say in your mind? Do you, is this just me? Do you think, I need to pick the right one, right? Like there's going to be a wrong one? But you get one shot at the meal because you're out to dinner. That's all it is. No. But at my house, it's funny. Every single night, I get one choice for dinner. And I'm always happy. Isn't it funny the way we work sometimes? The way our mind plays games on us sometimes. But our text today is Paul's self-assessment, if you will, of grace in his life. We're going to take a look at that now. We're going into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 8 to 10. I'm going to read uh, verses 8 and 9, and we're going to be concentrating on verse 10. You're going to see verse 10 show up a few times today on the slides, more than it usually does. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 8, and, and 8 to 10, it says, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. Then last of all, he was seen by me, uh, seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by grace, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but great the grace of God which was with me. The grace of God is what had him labor. Had him labor. Let's have a word of prayer, and let's get into grace. Lord, I do thank you for this, this time, Lord. I thank you for your grace. I can give you nothing for the grace you've given me, Lord. I can just be thankful. And that is a beautiful, beautiful feeling. So liberating, Lord, that grace is dependent on you, not on me, because I would fail. Oh, you're so good to us, Lord. I pray that you guide my words today, Father, and people's hearts would be open to your grace. Thank you and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So, grace. We're getting here. But according to verse 8, as you look at those verses, okay, of all the apostles and the 500 witnesses that saw Jesus, you know, after uh, he ascended, right, okay, uh, Paul was the last. He was the last one. And Paul did not, like, technically, we don't know of it, uh, witness uh, uh, Christ till post 
post-resurrection and post-ascension, right? We know he, he post-ascension, he, 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 after Christ ascended to heaven, he, that, that Paul meant him then. Paul had a very unique apostleship when you think it through, didn't he? He really did. It says he was one born out of due time. It means, when I say born out of due time, that means like a premature birth or a miscarriage. That's what it said. It, it, he had a, he had a, his life was one that could not sustain life. That's what it means. It was a miscarriage. And you think of Paul when he was Saul, right? He was anything but a sustainer of life, right? He was a bad dude. He was a bona fide terrorist. That's what Saul was. He was a terrorist. I know something about terrorism. I used to work in the chemical terrorism laboratory. Okay, I understand terrorism. I've actually been trained by it, by the FBI. Terrorism just in, invokes fear on people. It invokes fear on them, okay? He was given unchecked power. Paul was the grim reaper to the grace-filled, wasn't he? If you were grace-filled, he was the grim reaper. He was the terminator, that's what this guy was. This is amazing grace. Song we just saying before this message. The Apostle Paul, who was known earlier as Saul, okay, is perhaps the best example of grace in the Bible. It's amazing grace that saved him. Think of it. This man, Paul, was a Jesus hater. He hated Jesus. He was a bona fide hater. It was an amazing the way he acted. Think of this. Jesus' mission was complete, right? After he ascended to heaven, mission complete. The Holy Spirit has manifested in the world the way God the best of our knowledge has never manifested himself before. He was residing inside believers, and we became the temple of the Holy Ghost. I, I don't see it any place else until we get the New Testament. The apostles have gone out to spread the gospel. This one guy, Saul, zealous and powerful, thinking that he is doing God's work, okay, is trying to destroy the bride of Christ. He's going to destroy the church. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing in Ephesians 5.25. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's who Paul's trying to destroy. The very thing that Jesus gave his life for, the church, the bride of Christ. We need to personalize this sometime, the church, the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're the church. We're the church. We really and truly need to think this way. Same church 2,000 years ago, same church now. That needs to be evident in our lives. If we can actually capture that in our mind, our daily walk will be quite different. We'll have a much more holy walk. Remember, I am the bride of Christ. He saved me by his grace. I don't know that we think that way. Might be something for us to think on, don't you think? I do. I do. God's grace came to Paul. Saul, not Paul, came to Saul because he changed to Paul. It's so crazy. Isn't it? At least I'm only off by one letter when I say it wrong. Don't worry. I know you know. I know you know what I'm saying. Okay, but it came to Paul, didn't it? It came to him on that road. Did my battery die? No, it didn't. I was nervous there. I mean, I have to leave the message. In Acts chapter nine, verses three to five. This is Paul. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying, "Saul, Saul." Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's quite an encounter, isn't it? Only God can make light shine round a person, you think about it. And Saul, being a Pharisee, would have known this was all of God. There'd have been no doubt. This, you just know if light's shining all around you. It ain't an alien. It's God. That's what happened. Now, one may think, think of this guy. He's persecuting Jesus. He's persecuting his church, okay, doing all this. Why does the, the sovereign of the universe just take him out, right? He's a bad guy. Take him out. Isn't that easy? Isn't that easy? He's an enemy. But in Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies... Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. What was Paul doing? Saul, Paul, he was persecuting. He was persecuting Jesus. Now, understand this. When, we, when you read that verse, the Old Testament law did not say to hate your enemies. Okay? That's not what it said. It's not what it said. However, 
the religious system had degraded to this position. We started to hate our enemies. That wasn't what God wanted people to do, but that's what they were doing. Another reason why Jesus came at the time he did, he's kind of putting an end to a lot of things, isn't he? It's an amazing thing. God's ways really aren't our ways, because that's not how we operate. Think about it. Think about that. What, what Jesus just said, you know, you're not hating your enemies but loving him, uh, that's not going to get a lot of likes on social media, right? Because on social media, what do the people look for? They're looking for drama and hatred, right? You ever got a whole love going on? You know what people are going to do? They're going to scroll over. Not going to get a lot of likes. Isn't that kind of funny? I, was, I would tell you to go online and check that out, but don't even go online. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up. Yeah. God would demonstrate his grace, his unmerited favor in a fantastic way. The persecutor was completely blind spiritually. And, and, and this, on this account to, on to Damascus, when he gets there, he's also physically blind for three days. And it's a funny thing about the, being made physically blind for three days. He was put in a real position of vulnerability, wasn't it? I mean, if you just close your eyes, I'll put a blindfold on. Go home this afternoon and put a blindfold on. Sit on the couch for 15 minutes of blindfold on. See if you don't feel vulnerable after a little bit, right? You won't get up because you know you're going to go down if you do. Vulnerability would be there. Yeah. God got his undivided attention is what he did, completely vulnerable. And there's times in our life when we actually do feel vulnerable. They really are. When you do, don't go into the fetal position. I know things are going to happen. It's going to be really hard in life, isn't it? It sure is. But we need to seek out God's will in those difficult times. You know, I, I, I got this, this. I read it yesterday. Another one of these magazines with the voice of the martyr. I love these things. Whew. They don't play games. This one is about pastors in Tanzania. Tanzania. This pastor on the cover, he was attacked, he and a friend of his, with machetes. His friend was killed. His leg was just about cut off. Somehow they saved it. They just did, okay? He and his family praised God for his leg being maintained. They did not ask God why it happened. Do you know why? They were serving God. They knew they were going to be persecuted. Imagine a machete attack, and they're praising God for it. If you read this magazine, there's several examples just like that. Praising God for it. It's amazing, ladies and gentlemen. That's amazing grace, isn't it? Back to our text, 1 Corinthians. Back to it. Paul, he's speaking in, in Corinth, and he, it's a full acknowledgement of his persecution of the church. That's what he's given these people. Because of God's grace, the persecutor becomes an apostle. One sent out. That's amazing, isn't it? He's the worst. He becomes an apostle. He's sent out to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The man that was bent set on destroying the bride of Christ. Okay? Now, three times in verse 10, we see the word grace. It's there. It's so cool. By, by, but by grace, by, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace towards me, he was is not found in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Grace three times in there. A couple of thoughts about this grace. First thing was, the grace of God is by God. It's exclusively of God. It's not of Pastor Pete. I got none. It's of God. And grace was towards Paul, wasn't it? Grace is always towards us. Our spiritual blindness hides God's grace. You ever think about that? Our spiritual blindness can hide God's grace coming right at us, okay? And it's funny. Paul sort of wasn't afforded that, that, that opportunity, right? He was knocked down. He says, no, I want your full undivided attention. In fact, I'm going to blind you. And the grace was with Paul as well, it says at the end. It was God's grace doing the labor that Paul talked about. All that labor he did was of God. Read through Acts. Paul did tremendous things. He should have been very tired. In Romans 1.1 1, 1 it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Bondservant there gets interpreted and in, in, uh, translated many different ways. It's bondservant, it's servant, it's slave. It's the word doulos, okay? He was slave. He gave up his entire life, and he was all in for Christ. Everything he did it was an amazing thing. The recipients of grace are totally undeserving. 
There's no human capacity that I can see where Paul is worthy of receiving grace. The guy was a bad man. Why is he going to get grace? That's just me. I'm pretty finite, aren't I? I think we can relate to that. But we know better because we have Christ. We just do. You know, if grace is what we expect it to be, though, we totally miss the essence of grace. That's holding grace at a low bar. You know, we have images of grace from our perspective of humanity, I do. What I hope to bring to light today as we go forward through this is the depth of God's grace. That's my goal today. Start by this, something simple. Simple being a relative term, huh? When's the last time any of us have given someone undeserving love? And your children don't count, <laughs> right? Someone, your undeserving love. Yeah, there's this stuff going on back there, guys. You, I'm, I see everything. <laughs> yeah, undeserving love. It's so good. Yeah, it's a hard thing to do. But look at the position of Saul, right? He was caught red-handed going to Damascus, Damascus to round up people, right? In Acts 9, verses 1 and 2, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if any be found who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Whew. Sounds like Saul has some anger issues. What do you think? He sure did. Murder was in his heart. That's what it was. Matthew 5, 21. Jesus said, You have heard it said that th of old, Thou shalt not murder, and whoever murders and is in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoa. Andy's up a little bit, huh? Yeah. Something's not lining up. Think of this. He's going to a synagogue in Damascus to capture Jews. Think about that for a second, right? God's own chosen people, his brothers and sisters, he's going to round them up. That's a scary thought. It really is. You know what Paul was doing? So, in this case, Saul becomes Paul. Saul was breaking the sixth commandment. Thou shalt not murder. Yeah. He wants to go get it. I know you said, oh, he's just rounding him up. Folks, you went to prison at these times, okay? <laughs> Men and women, I don't, there's a good chance you're going to die. Oh, there is, okay? And think of this. The high priest sent Saul with letters of authorization to commit murder, if you will, basically, at the synagogue in Damascus, okay? That's the high priest was complicit with premeditated murder. I don't know how well you can see this, okay? Sometimes we need to look at these verses and stop, and we need to stop and see something that's happening in the verses. That's what's really happening. Now, Saul was the worst. Okay. He's hunting down the innocent in their place of worship. Do you ever think about that? He's going to their place of worship. We hear about places of worship being attacked all the time now around the world, don't we? When they do, you know what I think of it? I think of it as the Saul syndrome. Any place that gets attacked, because that's what Saul did. Threats and murderous thoughts at them. It's amazing. Man's blindness, how we can get to this point. Now, Paul was thankfully aware of the grace that had transformed him as he spoke these words. Because he, he's speaking to the Corinthians. He's telling them some things, right? He's telling them some things regarding grace. And that's what he's telling the Corinthians. Because the Corinthian church was a mess. <laughs> they were a mess, right? Read about them. Think of this church that Paul, he's opening up his life to. They were in a dark place. Paul pointed out to them that their sexual sin was worse than the Gentiles. Meaning what? Remember, you look at Paul's history. Remember he was in Ephesus? He's in Ephesus. The temple Diana was there. And it would have been a proud day for his father to be a temple prostitute priestess in Ephesus. That's what it was. Go to the book of Ephesus. It was a dark place. Same thing here. And Paul's telling these people, you're worse. You're worse. Can you explain that to me? Because I can't. Let me go on further. Why did God allow depravity under the same roof where divinity was being preached? You ever think about that? Think about that. I have. If you dig deep enough, you'll see that it's grace. Grace goes to any length to be given to the undeserving. That's what grace does. We need to go to the undeserving folks as we should understand better than anyone else the plight of the undeserving, because we know that we're not deserving, 
right? Didn't it just make sense? They're not deserving. I can identify with that because I'm not either. We need to go to them. Paul went to this church. It was a mess. You know what happens too fast is people sometimes so far they think, people will think sometimes they stumbled so far, so far into the darkness that there's no return. This is what happens to people all the time. It really does. In fact, the thought of returning to any semblance of morality is just out of their thought processes. They can't even think that way anymore. It's happening to people all the time. It's so hard. We're forgetting we're creatures created in God's image. We are the only creatures that are extended God's grace. Think about that. It's a gift. Being a gift, it means it has, there's nothing we can do to pay for it, and we certainly don't deserve it. We have nothing to give for it. Now, it's fair to say that Saul had gone down a very dark road by the time he was on the road to Damascus, okay? After all, Paul oversaw the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. They were dragging Stephen out. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul oversaw the stoning of a person. When I say he was a murderer, I mean he was a murderer. He really was. Can we see the depths of God's forgiveness in this guy? In Romans 5.20, it says, Moreover, the law entered in, the law entered, that the offenses might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that sin reigned in death, even so, grace might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It seems like a battle, but it's not. What the law did, it made our offenses obvious, okay? It brought them out, made them apparent. Because without the law, there's just chaos. There is just chaos. The sin of Saul was abounding. God's grace abounded much more. Sin did and does bring physical death. Jesus Christ brings eternal life. Think of it. Saul was actually opposing the giver of eternal life, and God's grace intercedes for him. It's an amazing thing. Now, this all sounds amazing, right? This is amazing grace. Do, 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 do. The song we sang, uh-huh, it's good, right? Intellectual, you got this. We got this. I got a peak. Grace, it's cool. God steps in and saves the day. Yay! It was like down in Sunday school, you ask the children a question. You've got to pump the children. Always just say, Jesus, and the kids usually get it right. It's a cute thing, but uh, grace is supernatural. I don't deserve it, but God offers it, to, offers it to me, okay? Great, but you know there had to be a but. It's been going too easy, right? Are we really seeing grace clearly? Do we see grace clearly? Is grace tangible to us? Is it so real in our lives that our lives are an expression of grace? Maybe you've heard of a gentleman by the name of Charles Swindoll. He's about 88 years old. He's a pastor and a theologian. Pretty smart guy, okay? He wrote some thoughts about grace that I'd like to share with us. And the essence of what I'm going to share in a couple of moments, might, you might find a little offensive and chilling. It's okay. You're in a safe place. <laughs> Once again, just one verse, a couple of verses first, though. In Romans 5, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Being justified, okay, doesn't mean as though I have never sinned. That's not what it means, being justified, okay? It doesn't mean like that, okay? I still sin, sorry. If you came to listen to a sinner today, ha <laughs> ha, joke's on you, all right? We all still sin. I understand that. At some frequency, at least. But we, like Paul, we need to acknowledge our sin. I mean, Paul is acknowledging his at church in Corinth. Grace is my sustainer even in my sin. All the more reason to be grateful for my grace. It might even slow down my rate of sin, huh? It does. Trust me. Get into God's grace. It'll slow down your rate of sin. It'll change your thought processes. Well, let's take a deep dive into the picture of grace that Charles Swindoll painted regarding grace, okay? Let's look at it this way. Imagine you have a young child. You have a young child. Some of you do, Rhea, right? And that child is kidnapped and murdered. Chilling, huh? It's nasty stuff. 
You know, I, I, I mentioned this, I was mentioning it last night during our game night. Uh, you may have heard about Charles Lindbergh. He's a guy that, first guy to flow, fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo back in the 1920s. Uh, from the game we were playing, it was like 33 hours and a thir 33 hours he did it in. But he did that. But it was a horrible thing that happened to this man. Uh, after he did that, he's downstairs in his house. And upstairs in the, in the bedroom, his 20-month-old son was kidnapped, held for ransom and murdered. This stuff happens. It just happens. It's so hard. So imagine you had a child and they were kidnapped and murdered. Suppose under some circumstances the murderer was captured and you used every means possible to have that murderer put to death for that crime. Somehow you got to him like in a movie, right? You know in the movies they say, I got people on the inside that are going to get to you? Suppose you did. You got to him on the inside and you had that person killed, right? You killed the perpetrator, that murderer. That death would be vengeance. Right? That would be vengeance. However, second scenario. If, however, you let the legal system work, goes through the trial system, trial of their peers, okay, they're found guilty and they're convicted, and they have given a sentence. Depending on the state you're in, capital punishment, life imprisonment, I don't know. That's not important. The point being is the justice system worked, so in that case, via the law, justice would have been served. That would be justice. Without the law, there'd be no morals, folks. Just keep that in mind. Take away the laws, see what the world would be like. People don't like laws, because we don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> Just get over yourselves. That's what I have to do every day. But instead, that convicted person, you plead to have them pardoned the murderer of your child. You forgive them completely. You invite them to your home. You adopt them as your son. That would be great. You see why it's really hard for us to grasp grace sometimes, the essence of it? The essence of it. Is that what we think we would do? Is that what we think of grace? Because I don't think that way. Very few of us would do what I just said. God does it every single day. God extends his love that way every single day. That is grace. God takes those that said that I'm lost. I'm guilty as charged. I'm undeserving of forgiveness. And he extends the gift of eternal life because of Jesus, what Jesus Christ did on the cross and the empty tomb that followed that. That is grace. His grace, unmerited favor. It doesn't feel so sterile now to me when I say that. How do we believe grace like Swindoll described? Because I call it grace to the extreme. <sighs> so hard. Now, I'm not sure that any of us can grasp this yet. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with it myself. Jesus alone can call a person to follow him. All of his disciples had an invitation, right? That rich young ruler, he got an invitation he rejected. Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus, Damascus, a radical calling for a man devoid of God. He had the best teachers, Saul did, but he didn't have God, right? Jesus does not call us to come and listen to him like it would be a scribe or a Pharisee or a teacher or a pastor. No. When G you know, when you go, those guys speak, you know, or, or you might say after, you know, Pastor, that was a great message. Let's go out to lunch. No. When Jesus spoke, people's lives were changed. Their lives were changed. You remember last week in John 7, the officers were supposed to arrest Jesus. They came back to the, to, to the hierarchy. They said, we never heard a man speak like this. They were blown away in their hearts. They just were. He changed his lives. Once called, a disciple must throw off the previous existence and obey by faith. You know, sometimes believers feel they have a separation between themselves and Jesus. Jesus is divine and we are not. People feel like Jesus is over there and we're over here. The result of that is there's no intimacy, there's no relationship. He's over there. Go over there. Go to Jesus and do what he says. 
The separation is what we create. Don't let it exist. That might explain why so much of modern Christianity is experiencing such a power shortage, okay? Because we're not going to Jesus and doing what he said to do. Are we going to the undeserving? Folks, I'm undeserving. I am undeserving. So are you. And if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but you're not. You're not. Is the church ready to die to itself? Those exact words are not in the Bible, though. The church dying to itself, it's not. It's not. But just think of it. Two or three weeks ago, we just baptized three people. And what did I do? Right over here, we do. I just buried in the Christ, likeness of Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's a dying to self, isn't it? John chapter 3 in the beginning talks about being born again. You know why you're being born again? Because something had to die. Die to self. It's so important. It's so important for us to do that. As we go on our walk, we are sanctified. We will continually die to self if we're obedient. By grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. I know. Papa used that line, right? I am what I am. But it's a true statement. I can't be something other than what I am. But what am I? That's the question. Saul or Paul, whatever you want to call him, he was a persecutor of the church. He led the charge. Remember Judas? Judas was a little secretive. He, went, he did his job. He was secretive. No one knew what was happening. But not Paul. He was out there. He was zealous. He was right in the open. He's doing his thing. But grace, by grace, Paul realized that his external religious life was far from godly. Grace turned Paul from a persecutor of the church to a promoter and a defender of the bride of Christ. And he certainly put his life on it after he was saved. Grace is never in vain. The grace of God. Paul labored more than anyone, but he was never exhausted, right? Galatians 6, let us not grow weary in good while, and while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Paul became a new creature in Christ. Because of grace. Grace forgives what we think is unforgivable. Forgiving a murderer. Jesus on the cross forgiving those all around the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's grace. I am what I am by grace. So what am I? And what are you? What does grace do? Grace works to rest you you from you by progressively breaking your bonds to create that, that these bonds this, that this world creates and turning our deepest affections from those to God. That's what grace does. Do not suppress the grace that's been given to you. Let grace reign in your life like a bright light shining all around you. That's what happened to Saul. And what did Saul say, when he was on the road to Damascus, he asked God, Lord, what would you have me to do? Those were his words. Think of it. Those were his words, his first words. So, folks, I am what I am. By God's grace, why don't we find out what God will make us into? It's a beautiful thing. We are his church. We are the bride of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this message. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Genuine thanksgiving from my heart, Lord. I thank you so much for that, Father. I thank you for your goodness to me. I thank you for my goodness to my brothers and sisters that are sitting here, Lord. And, and if someone does not have your grace, Lord, I pray that they will come and speak with me about it or someone and want to understand more about it. It's a whole lot. It's so simple and it's so much. I thank you and praise you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh. It's amazing grace, isn't it? It is. Hey, could someone go down and let Chantilla know that I stopped? If you think, and, and, uh, and I did make one mistake. We're going to have the Lord's table in a moment, okay, which, which is good. We're going to have that. And I forgot to ask for two servers, so I'm going to ask. Joe, could you please be a server? <laughs> I, I kind of messed up. And when Dan gets up, we'll make him be a server, okay? I missed. I'm sorry. I'm not perfect. God's grace is pretty amazing, isn't it?
It just is. And it's hard. And when you look at it in real terms, it's amazing. It, it's, that's amazing grace. Uh, it just is. I hope to see some of you gardening in the next couple of weeks. Get dirty. It's fun. It gets fun to get dirty outside there together. Oh, and you know what I forgot to give out, folks? Anyone? I'm going to remember these. Uh, the Note Keepers Club. So that way you can write down. You look at the, I say, you know, we say for the younger people.